Creationists believe that the first chapter of Genesis is a historically accurate account of the creation of the universe. However, some of the things that it says about astronomy are mind-blowingly absurd. For example, it explicitly states that the sun, moon, and stars were created to give light upon the earth and to mark the passage of time. For stars to give light upon the earth or to mark the passage of time, they have to be visible from earth with the naked eye. But of the 10 to the 22 stars in the universe, only 6,000 can be seen with the naked eye. That means that only 1 in 10 to the 18 stars are fulfilling their divine command to give light on the earth and to mark the passage of time. If the stars really were designed to be lights and timekeepers on earth, then they would beam their light directly towards earth. However, stars emit light in all directions, and therefore the earth only intercepts a tiny fraction of the light emitted from a star. We can calculate the fraction of starlight that is intercepted by earth as follows. Let R be the radius of the earth, and D the distance between the earth and the star. By the time that the light from the star reaches the earth, it is spread out over a sphere of radius d in an area 4 pi d squared. The earth intercepts a disk of radius r from the sphere of light and this removes an area pi r squared from the expanding sphere of light. Thus the fraction of starlight intercepted by the earth is pi r squared divided by 4 pi d squared or 0.25 r over d squared. For the sun this is only 4.54 times 10 to the negative 10. For the next nearest star, Proxima Centauri, which is 4.243 light years away, this ratio is 5.95 times 10 to the negative 21. For Vega, which is 25.05 light years away, this ratio is 1.81 times 10 to the negative 22. For Betelgeuse, which is 642.5 light years away, this ratio is 2.75 times 10 to the negative 25. The point is that even the stars that are actually doing their job of giving light upon Earth and marking the passage of time are very bad at it, since only a tiny fraction of the light emitted from these stars actually intercepts the Earth. Most creationists interpret Genesis 1 to mean that everything above the Earth's atmosphere is meant to give light on the Earth and to allow humans to mark the passage of time. This leads to further problems. Most of the mass of the universe is made of stuff which cannot emit any light at all. This includes the 69.2% of the mass of the universe that's in dark energy and the 25.82% that's in dark matter. So 95.02% of the mass of the universe comes from stuff that, by their very nature, are completely incapable of emitting light. 4.82% of the mass of the universe is made of ordinary matter, that is, neutrons, protons, and electrons. However, only 10% of this mass is in stars. The remaining 90% is in intergalactic space, where it remains invisible to this day. Of course, the universe is filled with lots of stuff that can't be seen from Earth with the naked eye. My personal favorite example is the cosmic microwave background. This is a gas of microwave photons that uniformly fill the universe. There are 1.62 billion photons in the cosmic microwave background for every proton and neutron in the universe. And of course, we can't see a single one of these photons. There is also a cosmic neutrino background with similar numbers of neutrinos, each of which is also totally invisible to the human eye. There are lots of other things in the universe that are not fulfilling their divine command to give light upon the Earth and mark the passage of time. These include white dwarfs, neutron stars, black holes, quasars, supernovae, gamma ray bursts, interstellar gas and dust, radio waves, infrared radiation, ultraviolet radiation, x-rays, and cosmic rays. There is another awkward thing about the Genesis 1 account of creation that is almost always overlooked. Genesis 1 actually tells us where the sun, moon, and stars are located. On the first day, God created the earth as a formless mass of liquid water. Then, on the second day, God created a vault, which we call the sky, that divides the mass of water into two separate bodies. The water under the vault becomes the ocean on day three. While Genesis is eerily silent about what happens to the water above the vault, 
although it presumably is the water that we experience as rain. The real issue comes on the fourth day because the passage says that the sun, moon, and stars were placed in the vault of the sky. This is a problem because the vault of the sky separates two bodies of liquid water, one above it and one below it. So the passage is saying that there is a layer of liquid water above all the stars in the universe. But there are stars billions of light years away, so this body of water must be billions of light years away. But this is ridiculous. Why would God take water from the oceans and put it so far away from Earth that we can't even see it? This is especially enigmatic if everything in space is supposed to be visible from Earth. Of course, the people who came up with this story had a very different understanding of the universe than we do. They no doubt thought of the sky as a solid metal dome upon which the sun, moon, and stars were physically attached. The dome was created on day two, and the water that was removed from the oceans was put above the dome where it was stored to be used later as a source of rain and other precipitation. Creationists, of course, will never admit that the scriptures that they hold so near and dear contain such utter and complete scientific nonsense. A much more commonly discussed problem with Genesis 1 involves time scales. Creationists interpret this chapter to mean that all of the 10 to the 22 stars in the universe were created in 24 hours, just 6,000 years ago. This conflicts with modern astronomy. Astronomers have actually been able to measure the rate at which stars in the universe form as a function of time from 650 million years after the Big Bang to the present. They can do this by observing star formation in galaxies at different distances from Earth, keeping in mind that the farther away from Earth that a galaxy is, the more time its light took to reach Earth, and thus the farther back in time we are looking when we observe the galaxy. Needless to say, astronomers do not find that all the stars formed in 24 hours 6,000 years ago. Instead, they find that stars began forming within a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. The rate at which stars formed was low at first, but then it increased until about 10 billion years ago. Since then, the rate at which stars form in the universe has been decreasing. There are a few other anomalies in Genesis 1 worth mentioning. Plants are created on day 3, even though the sun, which is needed for plants to do photosynthesis, isn't created until day 4. The earth was created on day 1, before the stars on day 4. But we know from astronomy that the first stars formed more than 9 billion years before the earth formed. There is also that weird thing where God created light day and night on the first day, despite there being no sun, moon, and stars until the fourth day. Finally, there is the distant starlight problem. If all the stars were created 6,000 years ago, then we should only be able to see stars that are less than 6,000 light years away. This is because light travels one light year per year, and thus there hasn't been enough time for light from objects more than 6,000 light years from Earth to reach us. Creationists have come up with a few ways to solve this light travel time problem, but there is no consensus.